Hello and welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Giuseppe Rosano, a professor of cardiology and a consultant cardiologist at St. George's Hospital NHS Trust University of London and the president of the European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Association. Get ready to learn from one of the best in the field of cardiology. In this video, proudly brought to you by the P2PMD network, Dr. Rosano will be sharing his expert insights on heart failure. In the succeeding video titled, How Best to Discharge Your Patient with Heart Failure, Dr. Rosano will be sharing his insights on how to safely discharge hospitalized patients with heart failure based on available scientific evidence. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Lucia for this invitation, and um, it's a privilege to be uh, with you. Uh, today. Uh, secondly, um, I'm so sorry I cannot be there in person. I would have loved to be there uh, um, in person and meet all of you uh, because the HFA very much values and uh, this course is uh, one of the key courses of uh, um, that the Heart Failure Association is uh, endorsing, supporting and uh, developing in, in collaboration. Uh, unfortunately, I've uh, been held because of uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, flights. What I will do in the next uh, uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes is to discuss uh, the importance of the uh, pre-discharge and discharge period in patients with um, uh, heart failure. This is the, my declaration of interest. Now, we know uh, very well the progressive decline in left ventricular function and in functional capacity and clinical status in patients with uh, heart failure. We also know that uh, now with uh, modern therapies, this paradigm has changed a little bit and uh, has uh, moved uh, a little bit to the right with um, uh, new therapies allowing a longer period of uh, stability. But then with patients uh, reach a tipping point from where they start to decline. So that is the period of worsening heart failure. Now, the Heart Failure Association, together with the American uh, um, societies, the Heart Failure Society of America, the Japanese Heart Failure Society, the Canadian New Zealand, uh, uh, and the uh, Australian and uh, the, the Chinese uh, Heart Failure Associations, have all to, together put in uh, a document that is uh, the universal definition of heart failure where we have identified clinical trajectories in heart failure that uh, uh, go from uh, the new onset de novo into improving a persistent heart failure and then the heart failure in remission that is a resolution of signs and symptoms with a resolution of structural and functional heart disease but it's just a remission because then patients then will tend to progress and uh, uh, we suggest not to use the term, you know, the term stable Instead, we need to use the persistent because heart failure is not stable. As we see, we've seen there is a progressive decline, and also we need to use uh, uh, we need don't need to use the recovered heart failure, or but heart failure in remission. And what is in uh, the remission is one important phase that goes between um, hospitalization discharge and the early months after discharge. We know that the risk of uh, future events is. Uh, very high in the vulnerable phase. Vulnerable phase is that the phase that is uh, in between the um, when patients are ready to be discharged up to when they reach a chronic, a a chronic uh, status. So three, six months after hospitalization. So we include discharge and the immediate post-discharge uh, period. Now, what is important in uh, this phase in terms of uh, stability, long-term prognosis, is how well patients are treated during hospitalizations. And these are data from the ESC, UAP, HFA long-term registry that uh, they looked at the uh, patients who had admission and a discharge. And you can see that those patients that were admitted, they were when they were wet, there was a 70% of the uh, of patients admitted with uh, that they were wet, but we've seen that 30%, so only uh, half of them, were completely um, uh, decongestant. The, there was a 30% uh, 
that when uh, at a discharge were still wet. So that means that we are not doing uh, our work properly. Uh, sometimes this is related to the fact that we tend to rush to discharge patients because of different issues, pressures on bed, uh, pressure, economic pressures in order to mass maximize the RGs. But at the end, we uh, don't stabilize enough our patients and we discharge them often wet. And therefore, patients are, that are at increased risk of future events. And we will see that uh, the importance of this, uh, this group of patients in uh, one of the, tri the recent trials that has been conducted. Uh, there are some, um, some predictors of um, uh, residual congestion at discharge, and uh, amongst these we have a tricuspid regurgitation, when, especially at entry when it's moderate to severe, the uh, use of IV diuretics, the use of beta blockers, but this may be uh, more signs of um, patients with uh, there tends to be more severe rather than being a real, real predictors of residual uh, congestion. But another important point is that when we look at the residual congestion, we see that when patients are wet compared to dry, we see that there is a significant in, uh, increased risk of future hospitalization. We see that patients with, uh, who are wet and cold uh, compared to those who are dry and warm have a fourfold increase of future events. And those who are dry compared to those who are, are wet and they are warm, they have a 60% increased risk of future events. So the residual congestion at discharge is an important predictor of future cardiac events. You can see that also um, uh, in, this, in this couple of Meyer curves, where you can see that uh, in green, the dry, warm patients, in uh, those who are wet and warm, have a significantly worse prognosis. And of course, those who are wet but cold, then uh, are significantly uh, worse. So congestion and uh, pump failure are the two main signs of a few poor prognosis after discharge. Another important problem at uh, discharge is uh, where patients are hospitalized and the implementation of medical therapies. These are again data from the um, ESC heart failure registry. You can see that there is a vast discrepancy in the use of RACE inhibitors and beta blockers between patients who are admitted in cardiology, where almost all patients are discharged with a beta blocker and a RAS inhibitor, compared to internal medicine, geriatrics, short stay, or intensive care. So that uh, puts a, an importance on the central role of uh, cardiology departments in the management of patients with uh, heart uh, failure. Of course, most probably we are doing uh, better, a little bit better what our colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic are doing, because if we look at the CHAMP heart failure registry, we see that uh, there is a large proportion of patients who are still discharged, not on an ACE inhibitor or not on an ACE inhibitor or an ARNI, or not on a beta blocker. So there is a still need to implement and improve medical therapy at discharge. So this has been acknowledged by the guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology and Heart Failure that uh, highlight the fact that a significant proportion of patients with uh, acute heart failure are discharged with uh, uh, minimal, uh, uh, sometimes no weight loss. So that means that these patients have, uh, uh, have not been uh, uh, treated adequately and uh, they have not been decongested um, ad adequately. So they often are discharged with uh, congestion and congestion at discharge is associated with increased risk of future events. And therefore there is a need for uh, increasing uh, diuretic dose now, we uh, can use different approaches. Of course, in patients with uh, reduced renal function, we need to increase the doses of diuretics. And often we see patients who are treated only with 80 milligrams of furosemide, whilst we need to go up to 200, 250 mill uh, milligrams just in order to have a good effect. Then the guidelines suggest that once the stabilization is achieved, uh, patients should be transitioned into oral therapy. And the oral therapy has three major aims. First of all, to continue to relieve congestion. So we need to 
adjust the dose of diuretics to the same uh, equivalent dose that is given IV, at least initially and at least until patients are not decongested. It's important to treat the comorbid comorbidities and to optimize medical uh, therapy. Then it is recommended to have a visit one or two weeks after discharge, uh, being this uh, in the outpatient clinic or being with uh, the uh, local heart failure nurse, uh, but that should be uh, a contact should be made. And uh, during this visit, it's important to review medications, look at blood pressure, heart rate, the signs of congestion, and uh, uh, eventually look at the measurement of renal function and electrolytes. Therefore, uh, it is important to uh, identify the hospitalized uh, period as a period of increased risk, but it's also a period of opportunity because it's a period when we can optimize uh, uh, the medical therapy, we can discharge our patients on an optimal medical therapy and then titrate the different doses. Now, we, we know that uh, the uh, use of uh, uh, um, medical therapy at discharge is associated with a better prognosis. These are data from Optimize HF that demonstrated that the use of carbidilol at discharge was uh, better than no use of a beta blocker. Then these are uh, data from the Attic HF, Attic HF study that demonstrated that it probably is even better to uh, control heart rate, at least in the first phase after hospitalization, using a combination therapy of um, uh, ivabrevin and uh, uh, beta blocker because that enables the uptitration of other um, uh, pillars of uh, um, heart failure management. Uh, there is evidence uh, from the GRADE uh, registry uh, that uh, the use of uh, uh, beta blockers and uh, RASI or MRAs is associated with a significant improved um, uh, um, uh, prognosis after uh, discharge. And uh, you can see that this is true for the 90 day mortality and the one year uh, mortality. And uh, uh, when we look at the more comprehensive therapy, where we look at RASI plus beta blockers versus beta blockers alone, we see that uh, this is probably the, be the best uh, uh, um, uh, improvement in survival. And uh, these data have uh, already confirmed what uh, the CB3 has demonstrated is that uh, we need to uh, implement full medical therapy. The problem with uh, medical therapies is that uh, uh, we often have uh, therapies that have been proven to be effective in either in the acute, very acute phase or in the chronic phase. Whilst uh, uh, there are very few trials who have uh, assessed the importance of medical therapy or the effectiveness of medical therapy in uh, uh, patients who are ready to be discharged or in the vulnerable phase. These are mostly the data, uh, the, the, the most recent trials like uh, Galactic uh, with Omecamptin Macabil, Victoria with Verisiguat, Solis with Sopagliflozin and Impulse with Empagliflozin. Now regarding Sacubitri uh, Valsartan, we know that uh, the transition study demonstrated that the feasibility of starting a circubitril valsartan pre-discharge. And uh, the Pioneer HF demonstrated that is associated with uh, a significant uh, uh, reduction in uh, BNP levels. Also, the Pioneer study gave uh, uh, conflicting results compared to the Paradigm HF as it did not demonstrate any effect on renal function or on hyper, uh, hyperkalemia or in angioedema compared to the paradigm, H, paradigm HF. Uh, more recently, we have uh, data with uh, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. These are data from the IMPULSE study with uh, um, empagliflozin that demonstrated that in patients with uh, uh, acute heart failure ready to be discharged, the initiation of uh, empagliflozin was associated with a significant greater clinical benefit compared uh, to placebo. And that was mostly due to an effect on uh, um, uh, time to death, heart um, uh, failure hospitalizations, but also quality of life. In the same uh, period of the vulnerable phase, we have another drug that's been tested, and this is Verisiguat. 
and Verisiguat in the Victoria study demonstrated a significant reduction in the combined endpoint of uh, heart failure hospitalizations and mortality. The, uh, the study has been seen as a little bit disappointing, but I have to say that this is not, shouldn't be the case as the uh, um, com uh, uh, comparing the 10% relative risk reduction, the absolute risk reduction was very significant where there was a 4.6 um, absolute risk reduction in this study compared to 2.6 in uh, paradigm HF, for example. What was important from the Victoria study is that there was a, a consistent effect independently of EGFR or the use of sacubitril valsartan, but it identified patients with ele very elevated va um, values of NT or BNP as patients who are at increased risk. These are pa those patients I showed you earlier, those patients who are discharged when they are still congested. Therefore, it is important to discharge patients and start them and initiate them on oral therapies only and solely when they are completely decongested. Because if they are congested, they will, then we won't see any beneficial effect of our medical therapies. Another therapy has been tested recently, has been the uh, uh, ferricarboximaltose, that was shy to show a, uh, a significant difference between uh, uh, um, uh, intravenous ferrocarboximaltose and placebo uh, started at discharge. However, the study was uh, affected by the COVID pandemic and when it was uh, uh, analyzed, uh, censoring all patients that have been included, have been uh, censored by uh, <clears throat> the 3rd of March 2020 when uh, COVID-19 was declared pandemic, a pandemic, you can see that the results of the study were positive. Data, similar data of what we've uh, uh, observed with uh, <clears throat> Verisiwat was, well, was observed with Omecamtiv Mercabil that is still not on the market anywhere. But of importance, the Omecamtiv Mercabil demonstrated a significantly greater benefit in those patients with a low ventricular ventricular function below 30%, especially when combined with the absence of atrial fibrillation. So at the end, um, uh, we need to optimize as much as we can our medical therapy at discharge. And uh, what we should aim is to start the four foundation therapies together, the SGLT2 inhibitors, beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors or ARNI, or the MRAs. What is important is to start them at low dose. Then we can uh, uh, up-titrate the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, or even the MRA, so according to the heart rate, blood pressure, presence or absence of CKD, or absence, presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. But what is important is that in the vulnerable phase, we will implement all our four foundation therapies when uh, taking into account the presence of congestion. So we need to decongest our patients. We need to treat them appropriately. We need to do uh, whatever we can to discharge them right. Thank you very much for your attention. That concludes Dr. Rosano's expert sharing. We hope you had fun and gained new knowledge from watching the video. If you have questions or clarifications, feel free to type them in the comment section below or write us an email at p2pmd.net at gmail.com. Dr. Giuseppe Rosano will be more than happy to answer your queries. Mm -hmm.